Grace and peace to you all here on this sixth Sunday after Pentecost. My name is Reed Baer, pastor at West Parish of Barnstable, United Church of Christ, and we are so glad that you have found time to join with us today. Okay, I get it. You might be wondering why the life jacket and the helmet and the paddle, and why I'm standing knee deep in this raging torrent here at Squirtin Creek. Trust me, all will become clear in due time. But first, let's begin with a hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Written by Charles Wesley, the hymn describes God's perfect love and the hope that this love will dwell within us and so transform us each day to be more loving. Friends, as we enter this time of prayer, take a moment to center yourself. Seek God in the peace of this place, of whatever place you find yourself in at this moment, and bring to God what you carry and all that burdens you. Let us enter into the spirit of prayer. Eternal creator and redeemer of all, we praise you and give you thanks for the gifts of life and love. Though we were born children of earth, you have taken us in your arms and made us children of heaven. Let your love glow within us with renewed force that through our lives, others will come to know your grace, your power, and your love. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We read in Luke's gospel, that Jesus' disciples came to him in a certain place and asked him how they should pray. And in response, he teaches them what we now call the Lord's Prayer. But Luke does not specify where that certain place was. Today, let us imagine that it was alongside the Sea of Galilee, a setting for much of the Gospels. And perhaps let us imagine this prayer as a sort of spiritual life jacket, one guaranteed to buoy us up when we fear, to keep us afloat when we struggle in a sea of doubt, and to lift us up when we fret that we don't even know how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It has been said that religion is a way of walking, not a way of talking. In our reading for today, Jesus has been walking for some three years, teaching in parable and story, modeling a radical, inclusive love for God and for all people. Now, Jesus is in Jerusalem, and once again, the lawyers seek to hide behind words to trap Jesus. He will answer their question with not a new teaching, but instead with what they already know by heart. Two commands from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Our second reading is a prose poem by the late Mary Oliver, a Pulitzer Prize winner for poetry and winner of the National Book Award and the longtime resident of Cape Cod, read to us today by Greg Williams. West Wind number two, Mary Oliver. You are young so you know everything. You leap into the boat and begin rowing. But listen to me. Without fanfare, without embarrassment, without any doubt, I talk directly to your soul. Listen to me. Lift the oars from the water. Let your arms rest and your heart and heart's little intelligences. And listen to me. There is life without love. It is not worth a bent penny or a scuffed shoe. It is not worth the body of a dead dog nine days unburied. When you hear a mile away and still out of sight, the churn of the water as it begins to swirl and roil, fretting around the sharp rocks. When you hear that unmistakable pounding, when you feel the mist on your mouth and sense ahead the embattlement, the long falls plunging and steaming. Then row, row for your life toward it. Even as I knew with a big part of my mind that there really was no going back, that getting out and off was not really an option, and that it was probably going to be fun, probably, a part of me still played with the fantasy that there might be a way to set the clock back an hour or so magically and get off this rather flimsy, it seemed to me, rubber raft. A raft which was rapidly propelling me and seven others towards a large bend in the Snake River Canyon. Now the rafting company's brochure had touted their extensive safety record and had promised that rafting adventurers, as we were called, would get a thorough safety orientation. Now my confidence in the truth of the first claim was somewhat shaken by the patent falsity of the second. That thorough safety orientation turned out to be, oh, about a 30 second Riverside explanation of how to put on the faded life jackets they had handed out, together with some brief remarks that 
If we fell out of the raft, we were to point our legs downstream so that they would crash into the boulders before our skulls. I immediately resolved to stay in the raft at all costs. The river bend was drawing near, nearer, but it was not the bend itself that concerned me. Indeed, for the past 30 minutes or so, we had been drifting lazily down the Snake River, admiring the gently rising canyon walls along both banks, getting glimpses of the Grand Tetons now and again off to the west, even spotting an occasional bald eagle. Our guide had insisted that we novice rafting adventurers all, that we practice paddling, which mostly consisted of her yelling, Captain Bly-like, a stream of orders, paddle left, paddle right, full power, five strokes, reverse all, and so on. We were not very good at this. We did, however, improve remarkably when she told us that our ability, our ability to paddle was going to get us through the rapids or not, which was my concern. As the men got nearer and nearer, the canyon walls drew closer and closer together. A sound, a roaring was getting louder and louder, and the raft steadily picked up speed. A quick look at the waterproof map they had handed out showed that just around the rapidly approaching bend was something called a Category 3 rapid. How bad could that be, I thought. Looking over my shoulder, a fellow rafter said, oh look, they even named the rapids. I wonder why this one was named the Widowmaker. Well, by now the river had really got my attention, as had our guide, who ordered the right side to paddle to avoid a boulder, which flashed by to starboard, then called for three strokes from the left to line us up for the approach to what looked to be something you might see on the Discovery Channel or in one of those big screen Omnimax theaters about kayaking the Himalayas. A steep stretch of river that boiled and churned over boulders the size of cars and towards which we were headed like a runaway freight train. And it was at that point when I seriously wondered why I had not had the presence of mind to object way back at the boarding area when the guide had placed me not on the left side of the raft, not on the right side of the raft, not way back on the stern with her where she was safely ensconced, but on the blunt front of the raft. Full power, everyone yelled our guide. And the sensible, logical part of me, that wisdom and, and intelligence that had seen me safely through a few decades, said to me, are you nuts? Hit the reverse thrusters and get out of Dodge. But then, as our paddles furiously dug into the tossing waves, it became clear that the way out was the way forward, that it was only by aggressively working to move the raft forward through the water that we could have steerage way and so avoid that bus sized boulder on the left and that back eddy on the right but what about oh my god what about that huge hole right in front of us down 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 we slammed into that hole that sucking vortex in the rapids created in the lee of a submerged leg the raft buckling underneath my crouched legs. The front of the raft slammed into the wall of water at the bottom of the hole. A wave poured over my head, screaming with terror and some kind of weird joy. I furiously dug my paddle into the water and pulled for life. And then, and then we were up and out and spinning in lazy circles in the calm waters beneath the rapids. And so maybe you can see why Mary Oliver's little prose poem speaks to me as it does. It resonates 
with my experience on the Snake River. And it calls to mind Jesus' conversation with those recalcitrant experts of religion close to the end of his ministry. First, the poet calls us to stop, to listen, to pay attention. Put aside those distractions. Put aside that single-minded focus you have on rowing so diligently on a course that was set for you long ago. A course you might not even know why you are on right now. She writes, listen to me. Without fanfare, without embarrassment, without any doubt, I talk directly to your soul. Listen to me. Lift the oars from the water. Let your arms rest and listen to me. She goes on, here is the lesson you need to learn. This is what is ultimately important in life. Not success, not money, not the adulation of others, not some secret hoard of brownie points you accumulate for pleasing others. This is what is important. Love. For there is life without love, but it is not worth a bent penny or a scuffed shoe. It's not worth the body of a dead dog dying days unburied. This is, of course, Jesus' message. What is the greatest commandment? What is the divinely given rule? Which, if followed, will be both pleasing to God as well as life-promoting for the individual and the community? It's not complicated. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love, it's that easy. It's what I've been teaching you about all these past three years. It's what I've been modeling for you as we have healed the sick, as we have restored to the community those who were marginalized. And as we have welcomed all to our table, urged justice for the oppressed, sought sharing by all. It's simply this, love God, love yourself, and love one another. But Jesus' message, and that echoed by the poet, is not as easy as it first might sound. Love, the poet reminds us, is not simply warm and fuzzy and a feel-good emotion. Love is risky. Love is dangerous. Love, love can be costly. There really is nothing safe and secure about loving. Love, Mary Oliver tells us, is not a leisurely row on a placid lily pad strewn pond. Love is a heart-pounding, adrenaline-inducing roller coaster ride where there are no visible safety rails. It's an accelerating journey of increasing speed as a river is narrowed by steeply rising canyon walls into a foaming, churning rapids, a boulder littered, watery obstacle course where standing waves conspire to overturn your raft, where Charybdis-like whirlpools threaten to pull you under. This is what love sounds like. This is how love tastes and feels in the pit of your stomach. When you hear a mile away and still out of sight, the churn of the water as it begins to swirl and roil. When you hear that unmistakable pounding, when you feel the mist on your mouth and sense ahead the embattlement, the long falls plunging and steaming. Like Jesus speaking to the lawyers long ago, Mary Oliver tells you again what you already know. You know the risk and cost of loving. 
Why else did your stomach get all tied up in knots when she agreed to go out on that first date with you? Why did you hope and fear and hope some more that he would pop the question, would ask you if you would commit yourself to him for the rest of your life? Why else is it so hard to send your child away to school the first time and the second time and you wonder if it ever gets easier? Why else, why else does it pain you so when a loved one suffers or dies? Loving comes with risk and with cost. You know that when you volunteer at the hospital and come face to face with pain and suffering. You know that when you commit your time and energy to the young of this church through teaching in the church school or working at a youth event. You know that when you put yourself on the line for the homeless or struggling parents or people of different sexual orientation, or for our environment. You know that love is more than chocolates and flowers and mutual self-absorption. Love, in its all its wonderful life and life-affirmingness, love can be risky and costly. See, see where love took Jesus. The good news is that we can risk love because God loved us first. Because God loves us so fiercely that no matter the category of rapids we might face in our lives of loving each other and loving God, we have Jesus for our guide. We have the Holy Spirit to give us strength for the task at hand. And we have a God who was both in the raft with us and who promises us that at the last we shall be together at peace beside the still waters. So what to do? What difference does this make in your life? Shall you, when love comes knocking on your heart, shall you do the sensible and safe and sane thing and turn and run for your life? Or will you, learning the lesson we learned on that raft on the Snake River, for love and for life paddle with divine abandon? Listen to me. When you hear a mile away and still out of sight the churn of the water as it begins to swirl and roil, when you hear that unmistakable pounding, when you feel the mist on your mouth, when you sense ahead the embattlement, the long falls plunging and steaming, then row, row for your life toward it. Amen. <laughs>
Let us be in the spirit of prayer. O oh, love that will not let us go, we give you thanks for your ever-present love. A love which calls us to you with the hope and thrill of a lover seeking their beloved. With the trust and simplicity of faith of a child running to greet their parent after a day at school. With the steadfastness of a spouse 60 years married caring for the love of their life. With the boldness of one who in love travels to distant places to serve others and to grow through that service. We thank you for love in all its forms and we pray that love might abound all the more through our lives and in those we love. In this time when pandemic still ravages this nation and the world, we pray for many things. We pray that a vaccine will be found. We pray that more and better treatments will be developed. We pray that your people will summon the will to be part of the solution, not more of the problem, and make the sacrifices required to keep us all safe. In this silence and in love, we raise up to you in prayer this day all those in need of love, of healing, of the necessities of life, of hope, of comfort, of peace. Grant, we pray that your love might pulse in our veins more this day and in the days to come, that we might love as extravagantly as you do, that there be no limit to our goodness and to our pursuit of justice and peace. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who loved us so much that he became human and lived as one of us. Amen. Some early education professionals got together and asked a group of four to eight-year-olds what love means. Marianne, age four, said, love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. Rebecca, age eight, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his own hands have arthritis too. That's love. And my favorite, from Lauren, age four. I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. We also show our love by giving to make the ministries of this church possible. And so now we ask you to express that love generously. As you do, receive our thanks. Thanks to all who give by sending us a check at Post Office Box 219, West Barnstable, Massachusetts, 02668. And thank you to all who go to westparish.org and hit the donate button at the top of the page. Thank you, and God bless you. If you have found this service to be meaningful, if you would like to know more about West Parish of Barnstable and our ministries, please contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Give us a call at the office, 508-362-4445, or send us an email. And now, receive the benediction. Because we know that the river journey of life is not all lazy river and still waters, but has many a boulder-strewn rapid seeking to flip us into raging waters, Jesus' words about the need to pray always and not to lose heart are especially welcome. And so do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger women and men. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, but for powers equal to your tasks. Then the doing of your work will be no miracle. You will be the miracle. 
Every day you will wonder at yourself and at the richness of life which has come to you by the grace of God. So go forth in joy and amazement, blessed to be a blessing, a prayer in your heart and praise on your lips, now and every day. Amen.